previously on the Soundless Citadel. We're not really looking for a meeting with Balak. We're sort of here to take him down. Why is Black doing this? Due to his own shortcomings, he has become something different than other druids usually are. Do you know anything about the Apple of Virtue? It's the fruit of the tree that he cares the most of. That tree is not natural. Have you seen any other tabaxi? If... Someone was brought to Belak in his garden. Unfortunately, it is only for one reason only. Seeker is going to drop down to all fours and just run away. As you turn around, Mortis, to proceed, hesitantly, she quickly grabs onto your hand. Your friend was interested in the fruit of the tree downstairs. Indeed. It is a very, very powerful fruit, yes. But just as much as it gives that fruit to can take away, do not be swayed by it. Are you saying that using the fruit could be dangerous? Anything about that tree is dangerous. Throughout the vastness of the multiverse, there lies a tavern. As you approach its doors, you catch bubbles of laughter that rise and burst into cheers as colorful groups of travelers find comfort in their bonds. As you head inside, the smile of the tavern keeper greets you. They're an otherworldly being with a bluish corporeal form. They wear attire befitting of an innkeeper, and they have a large cloudy nebula for hair speckled with stars, which gently sways with their movement. Welcome to the Storyteller's Tavern, where stories are served like ale and a seat is open for you at every table. Tonight's special is the Sunless Citadel, an epic adventure of high fantasy with notes of friendship, danger, and most importantly, hope. Will our adventure survive to descend into the dungeon, or is there a dark and calamity taking root far from the sun's reach? Seeker, you stepped out of the room earlier in the scene. What are you doing outside? So after Seeker ran away, after hearing what they heard, they're going to go just in a corner, just tuck themselves under Bates' blanket that they have in their bag, and they're just going to be praying, and they're going to have their cat toy shoved in their mouth. They're freaking out, naturally, because if Faith is gone, do they really have a reason to be here? They're not going to leave their friends but it's definitely going to have an impact in how they continue on. Are you trying to hide yourself or quickest corner you found is where you placed yourself? The quickest corner I found, it's, I would presume it's pretty empty. And if you look, you'll be able to see Faith's blanket. It's got like a little like ball of yarn embroidered into the corner. So it kind of stands out. Mifuzula, you step in the garden of Daphne still covered in those low shrubberies, grab grass, and illuminated by the purple mushroom that creates dim light towards this entire area. Takes a few moments, but you finally find the little blanket of faith. And underneath it, you're quite sure a seeker resides. Methuselah is going to gingerly and slowly approach seeker under the blanket and sit down beside them and say, Seeker, are are you all right? I know it must be hard to hear, but if it's any consolation, we know what's happened to Faith. Just because Daphne said that the druid was feeding people to the tree, it doesn't mean that that was Faith's fate. She could have escaped on her own. I don't think you should lose Faith just yet. Methuselah is going to see a pair of lilac eyes peeking out from underneath the blanket. Well, I mean, you're right, Methuselah, but what if it is my fault? Oh, it's not your fault. Why would you think that? Well, I keep thinking, what if I can't get to her in time? What if if I had been faster, if I had been better at what I'm doing, she'd, she'd be okay. Well, 
No matter what happens, I think Faith would appreciate how far you've come, all that you've done. You know, you've braved this place, all the monsters, everything, and you've never left home. It's quite a big step. No matter what happens, I think that she'd be proud. Seeker's gonna ponder that for a moment before the rest of their head is gonna come out from underneath the blanket. All, all right, I suppose that all makes sense. I, I just got a little bit scared. We should we should go back. Thinking that I've lost her isn't going to help. And it, it might just cost us more time. We're, we're almost there, I can feel it. If you do need a moment, you can have one. And just feel what you're feeling. It's all right to do that. Thank you, Methuselah. I've never been through anything like this. I'm really blessed to have you guys here with me, and I, I know that y'all have been through a lot, but no one I'd rather guide me through grief if that's what it comes to. And we're right beside you, no matter what happens. And Seeker's gonna stand up and just kind of wrap Methuselah in a hug. I'll hug you back very tightly. <laughs> During your embrace, you guys hear the door open, and at a glance, you guys do notice Thorn stepping out of the door, stopping to look at you guys. And then moments after, Mortis comes out as well. When Thorn sees Methuselah and Seeker hugging, he'll walk over and he'll <laughs> hug them as well. He doesn't know what the context is, he just wants to be involved in the hug. Perfect. I'll definitely, like, let Thorn in to hug as well. He only reaches your knees, so he's hugging your knees. The seeker is gonna reach down and bring Thorn closer into the hug. Thorn? Yes! Uh, I, I hope that you take this the way that I mean it, but you're you're like a little brother to me, and I, I promise I, I'm gonna do everything I can to protect you. Thorn will a wisdom save if this is emotional damage. If you think he's spitting, yeah, I'll allow it. I got a 10. I would actually say that that passes. Through these kind words from Seeker, a certain warmth it starts to permeate inside of the chest of Thorn. The warmth of being loved. A feeling that it was a vague memory earlier, but now it is a comforting memory. Thorn smiles and gives you a bigger hug. He doesn't say much else. That's fine. This is a perfect moment. <laughs> At this point, Mortis is standing a few meters away and he just looks on the group with a warm smile. Erky steps close to Mortis. Well... We just need to make sure we get out of here fast, right? We don't want this to end. Well, in the very least, we know the path forward and what we must do. Belak must be stopped. He nods thoughtfully. Seeker's gonna see the two of them, and they're just- they're gonna incline their head, trying to get Mortis and Erky to join in the hug. Hesitantly, Erky looks at Mortis, almost as if waiting for him to do the first move. Mortis looks at the group and then he dips his head solemnly and he pauses for a moment. And then after like a few seconds of hesitation, he slowly walks over and joins the group hug. And because he's big, he basically wraps his arms around all of them. Ricky takes a few moments to figure out a best place for him to hug. And he goes in somewhere around this general area that Thorn is also hugging. And you guys embrace for a few moments. Alright, what do you guys do now? So, uh, shall we keep going? That door over there, perhaps Belak covered it so that it would be harder to find. Perhaps, or maybe when the Citadel fell, it, it could have caused some sort of caving. But it does look like that is the way down. I would agree, but I'm just wondering how other people would have gotten through that door, unless there's another way into the garden. Well, we could check that one out, or we could see the other routes. I think it's worth checking out. We don't really want to leave any stones unturned. All right. If you don't mind, I would actually like to say farewell to Daphne, um, if that's all right. I agree, Methuselah. I'd like to say goodbye to her as well, because I didn't really say anything to her after... You know, I asked my question and she answered and then I ran away. And I was raised to always be polite when exiting a conversation. I know sometimes we don't always have that option. Like when I stab someone and they die instantly. As soon as Methuselah mentions going back and talking to Daphne, there's a slight noticeable twinge on Mortis's face of just concern. It only lasts for a second. 
but it's noticeable. I, I think Methuselah is very attuned to people's emotions and just sees the twinge on Mortis's face and goes, Is, uh, is everything all right, Mortis? You look a little strange. Oh, uh, it's nothing, my friend. Just uh, this place is... Uh, I'm just recovering from the last battle is all. I would like to incite that. Could I also incite that? You've seen him after battle, and this definitely isn't a recovering from battle thing. He's clearly holding something back. I think Methuselah is going to keep that to themselves, just for now. I'll bring it up later. You guys head towards Daphne's room. Opening the rustic door, you were bathed by the sunlight of the interior of the room, and you're back inside of the nice and beautiful floral room. Methuselah will approach Daphne's tree and take a couple chrysanthemums out of their hair and just place it at the base of the tree. And then Methuselah is going to say, These flowers here, they grow in a beautiful meadow with the golden plains. It's where my muse and I planted our soul tree. It's a wonderful place full of fresh air and the smell of flowers. It's wonderful. Every year we, we visit on a special holiday. It's when all the elves go to the soul trees of family and lovers. It, it's not just romantic partners that go and see the trees. It's, it's everyone who has connection to these people that have passed on. Basically, it's to hold their memories close. And since these flowers mean a lot to me and, and my memory, it would be an honor if these flowers could grow here in your garden. Think of it as a promise that if it's possible, I'll stop at nothing to, to free you. Something so beautiful does not deserve to be lonely and trapped in such a dreary place. As you place the flowers at the base of the tree, you do hear her voice. I appreciate your thought and the gift. As she appears from behind the tree, smiles, and just looks at you guys as you guys are there. Uh, Seeker still is wearing Faith's blanket as an emotional support thing, and they're going to step forward. Daphne, I apologize. That was very, very rude of me. You're a very, very kind dryad. That is okay. I did not take offense. I understand how this can be an emotional moment. I have seen many emotional circumstances prior to coming here. Well, thank you kindly for all of your help. And like Methuselah said, we would like to get you out of here if we can. Maybe one day I will not mind, although I am fond of these plants too. So I would not like to really leave them unattended. I do not really care about leaving if it means that they will perish in the dark. But it would be nice to see the woods again. These plants are so beautiful and you have done an incredible job. And then Seeker is going to just... They're going to step back and allow for Mortis and if Erky wants to say anything, then he can as well. Mortis steps forward. As I said before, Daphne, we will not forget your plight. And hopefully by defeating Belak, we may bring this garden some sense of peace and remove the corruption that he has wrought throughout this land. Thank you, Sir Knight. Do not get yourselves hurt. He is very, very different from what you guys might expect. We appreciate your words of warning. And then he bows his head respectfully. And I think that if anyone were to defeat this druid black, I think it would be us, because we're quite different as well, but in a good way. You might be correct on that. She glances at you guys one last time, and then nods. As if to say goodbye, gingerly pushes her hands through the wood, and as if it was made of liquid, she just enters inside the wood. The tree remains stoic and powerful within this small little garden. I think at that exact moment, once we're alone, Mortis realizes that Thorn isn't with us, and he's like, All right, uh, perhaps we should... Wait a minute, what, where did Thorn go? With his old look look around. I can kind of look down and then realize that Thorn isn't there. Oh no, did we leave Thorn alone again? Or just has a moment of surprise and then it just s slowly shifts into just exhaustion. <sighs> that a little, we should get back. He probably wandered off when we were in the bigger room. Let's hope he didn't get into too much mischief. 
Uh, God's willing. Well, speaking as someone else who's very much mischievous, I enjoy Thorn's mischief. And Seeker's gonna wave to the tree and then go back to look for Thorn. In the meantime, Thorn, what did you do while the group was saying their goodbyes to Daphne? So Thorne's going to look towards the door that's half submerged in dirt, and I want to roll to see if this would be accessible at all. In regards to that, do an intelligence check, but this is a very easy one, so don't worry. I got a six. That passes. Quickly looking at the doors, you start to notice that there is no makeshift openings, not anything that would indicate actually getting access into the room. Although, almost as an instinct, more than an active search towards observing this door. You notice that there's no hinges showing on this side of the hall. So, which means this door actually opens inwards into their own room. You just need to push the door. I think seeing this, Thorne's going to go over to the half-buried door and give it a big show to try to open it. I must inform you that as you go and give the biggest shove you can, it is no different than trying to shove the wall for the sheer size and weight of this door. It is impossible for a small, menciated goblin to do anything about it. What about the other door? Is the other door massive in size? The other door is massive in size, yes. But there is an opening that allows you to enter and traverse to the other side. The one that Daphne came in from. Can Thorn put his ear to the door and see if he can hear anything from the other side? You place your ear to the door. And it's really difficult for you to hear anything. It is equivalent to placing your ear on the wall. Can I start digging really aggressively? You can, but before you decide to let your head depart from the wood of the door, you do notice a certain longing, almost as if like it was more comfortable to lean against the door than it was to just effortlessly step away from it. It is a split second, but you do feel, for that split second, more time. Thorn has no impulse control, so yeah, he's gonna start digging as aggressively as he can to try to get more of the door out. And you start digging and digging and digging and digging and digging, but it's very, very small amount of effort and progress that is done. The rest of the team find Thorn aggressively digging in front of this door. Should we keep trying this door, or should we try the other ones, perhaps? Taking a quick look at the door, does it look like we'd feasibly be able to dig out if we all did it together? Or? I'm not going to make you roll for this. Dig it out? No. But there might be a different way to open it. Uh, do you think this is the path forward? I think it could be, but it might be a little bit easier to maybe check out the other rooms or paths first. Uh, hi Mortis, Methuselah, I, I know you're trying your best, but you're not really helping over here, and we really need your help. Please? I just look at my mage hands, like, <laughs> I'm like, computing in my mind. I can really only lift like 10 pounds, I don't know how much help I will be. I am going to say that Erkin notices you in your little distress, and he goes, Don't worry, Methuselah, you can just... Put your shoulder against the door and push it with your legs. Oh, I suppose. I mean, I was thinking more of the digging route that we were going with. Oh no, digging would be impossible. Let me see if I can try something. He's gonna walk past Seeker and Thorn up to the door and he's gonna try to push it. This is a very difficult check, but you can do it. Athletics, please. That's a dirty 20. With sheer force of strength and determination, Mortis is capable to slowly push the door, making in horrible sounds of rust and wood creak. You even feel certain parts of the wood where you're placing your hands and to cave in a little bit, as the wood has been not taken care of during the time and passage of it. 
but you finally open enough for each and every one of you to enter the room one at a time. Almost like a slit of the door was open enough for you guys. It is important to say though, because this door was partially covered by dirt, you have about 10 feet drop to the actual surface of the room. Uh, Mortis steps back from the door, rubs the dust off of his hands. That seems to have done it. So the this path is open if we want to take it. Seeker is going to look at Thorn. Hi, Thorn, look, we did it. I am so proud of us. You both did very well. Good job. And then my mage hands are going to clap. And uh, thanks, I suppose, for your assistance, Mortis. Mortis just nods. So how's the room looking? Can we just go in or is there a bit of a drop? It is completely dark inside and there is a drop and a feet drop mortis shines the lantern down to see if he can make out if it's like a safe landing down there you place the lantern inside and through the light you're able to see that it is just solid stone ground at the very bottom of this 10 foot drop although you do notice something peculiar is the fact that this lantern you have been using at, at the lab to help you guide you, as it was also a dark environment. Inside of this room, the light of the candle within this lantern seems to be dimmer. Can I just tell that the oil is running out or something? You pull out the lantern to back inside of the garden, and it shines normally. You place it inside, it seems dimmer. Like Mortis has a quizzical look on his face. It seems like there's mostly stone down there. It might be best if we... Uh, use a rope so that none of us get injured on our way down. And, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but there's something strange going on with the light. Uh, it's almost as if it's being drained by some sort of effect. Uh, and then he turns to Methuselah. Uh, if you don't mind my asking, this, this lantern you gave me, is it magical at all? Oh, no. Ah. Uh. It's just a normal lantern. It's it's very decorative, though. Very nice. It's just a holy symbol. Well, I'll cherish it the best I can. Can I put my head into the room and just look and try to get a sense of, is there something magical here? And then in my mind, just trying to see if I know any of magic. I don't think I would, but that's worth a shot. Put your head inside. Do you want to do a perception check or... I'll do a perception check first. 13 on the perception. Once you put your head inside, you try to focus your attention. You even close your eyes a little, just to try to create a hypersense as to the inside of this room. First, you hear slow shuffling, the dragging of feet, and maybe a small moan from inside as well. Very, very faint, very quiet. And then, you're not very certain, but the little time that you have tried so hard to focus inside of this room made you somewhat tired, lethargic, but the moment you notice it, it gets away. I'll say too, that's especially noticeable because I don't feel tired. This was basically a callback to how those feelings were. Would indicate some sort of magical influence, because naturally you wouldn't feel that. I'll poke my head back into the room where everyone is and go. So I think that there might be something down there, and there's definitely some magic over that place. Weirdly made me feel tired in a way that I haven't felt since I was alive. Well, well if a magical effect is at play, it might be dangerous. Would we like to proceed down this path and risk it, or perhaps should we look for another way? When me and Mortis looked into the other side there's a drop right mm. does it look like it's a tunnel going somewhere or was it just a room just a room so from what we've seen it doesn't look like that's the path forward you just saw the very entrance well I, I personally would like to check out the other rooms and see if there's a safer path but I suppose if we wanted to go in there and see for, for sure we might be able to have somebody go down there just to scout I suppose I'm inclined to agree. If we are to consider this path, we should scout it out and make sure it's safe. Can I pause for a moment? I would volunteer myself, but I fear my lack of dexterity in the dark may 
prove unfortunate. Well, before you all arrived, Florences did put their ear to the door and did feel a little tired, but was able to shake it off very easily. So maybe if there was magics down there, Thorn would be able to resist it much more easily. That is true, if you want to go with that. What do you think, Seeker? I, I think Thorn should go. I do think it should be someone who can see in there, and that is a bit faster. But Mortis, I hope you're not taking offense to that, but you, you have said these things yourself, and we need to protect you. If anything, it would probably be best for me to hold the rope so that whoever goes down can get back up quickly, if need be. Well, if Thorn, if you don't want to go alone, I could accompany you. Else, from what I know, they can't be put to sleep by magic, and I could go with you if, if this was some sort of sleeping magical thing, and, you know, so you're safe and not alone. Well, yes, Thorns can go with Methuselah. I will say, Methuselah, if you go, we might have to tie the rope around you, since you can't pull yourself up. Yes, I understand that. Ayanda, uh, I'll stick back here with Mortis so that we have almost an even number of people on this side as there are on the other side. And if anything happens, I trust that you, the three of you, would come down at a moment's notice. Before we start to prepare for the descent, uh, Mortis is going to unhook the lantern from his belt and he's going to walk over to Methuselah. While you're down there, you might need this. Uh, I'm not sure how effective it will be in the whatever magical field is down there, but I hope it may guide you. Thank you. I'll be sure to bring it back to you uh, when we're done scouting. Uh, it is yours. Uh, I, I don't want to claim any ownership. Scratches the back of his head. Well, I'm accustomed to darkness, so you might need it down here more than I do. As the two of you enter the room, you notice that the darkness within this room, it's so dense, it's so charged, that even your night vision does not allow you to see as far as it should. The light of the lantern that should be able to illuminate easily about 30 feet of bright light is now barely emanating 10 feet of dim light. The rope is fastened around the waist of Methuselah. Thorn quickly climbs up to Methuselah's shoulder, and as if it was walking backwards, Methuselah starts to make the descent while Mortis holds on to the rope, assuring the safety of their friend. What do you guys do? We can't see anything really in this room. At the very edge of your night vision, you are able to see a swaying silhouette. Just the inkling of silhouette, like maybe the shoulder of what seems to be a small creature. Do you stealth to try to get closer to see what it is without being detected? Do the same, but instead of going with the lantern, I deck because I don't want to bring the lantern with me because that would be bad for stealth. So I'm just gonna have my hand hold it and leave one behind. Roll for me, the two of you stealth checks. Thorn got 11. I got a 19. Strategically leaving your hand behind with the lantern, you approach this silhouette with Thorn by your side, quietly and low, close to the ground almost, as approach close enough to be able to see this goblet that is just swaying to the sides and barely doing a raspy, moaning sound that you guys think it's like difficult breathing. In Goblin, Thorn is very gently and quietly, almost like a whisper, going to say, Are you okay, Francis? As you ask that in Goblin, the swaying starts to move a little bit further so it's to start to look at your direction as it continues to sway. Halfway through, facing you, you hear the as you guys get to see the full display of this goblin corpse that's just standing and now that has noticed you guys it starts to move and then more moans happens within the room as well let's roll for initiative Methuselah right ahead what can I see in front of me right now there's a dead goblin in front of you I can't see anything but I can hear other things like yes hear you can hear other things 
Methuselah's hand that they left behind is going to set the lantern down, and then like a fishing line, the hand's gonna float back as if it's being reeled in. And Methuselah's just gonna hold up their arm and it's just go into place as where it should. Methuselah's gonna swing around Yorick as they usually do and play a song. I am casting Vicious Mockery on the one undead goblin before me, and I am playing a tune that starts off comical, almost as if the song is going to make fun of how they're falling apart. Very like a nursery rhyme in that sense. But as the song plays, it becomes corrupted by the darkness. And so it becomes more out of tune and it starts to sound really old as if I'm playing on an instrument that is just not the best. I'm casting Vicious Mockery. A 10. That fails. That is three psychic damage and they have disadvantage on their next attack roll. The dead goblin with their decrepit corpse can barely keep it a hold together. But as the mockery tune of Methuselah permeates in the air, dimly illuminated by the magical power of their song, the shadow becomes strong. And in this area, it is empowered, adding plus two to the attack. It's five damage. Thorn, it is your turn. Thorn will start his turn by yelling, Danger! Danger! This is not going well! We may need some assistance! And just hopes that Mortis and Seeker hears it. And then he's going to reach down from his feet and pick up three pebbles. And as he holds them, they're imbued with this blue glow of magic. And fluorescent smiley faces appear on them as he casts magic stone. And then as his action, he's going to throw one of the stones at the zombie. Go right ahead. I got a 12 to hit. Glowing very faintly in your hand. The blue glow of the magic takes place. And then you shoot it with speed, almost as if it was a bullet that hits the target going through the body continues standing and moaning as it moves towards you guys. Thorn is going to back up behind Methuselah. Now it is the undead goblin who closes the distance towards Methuselah and with their slow and lethargic movement, they strike Methuselah. Although you're able to notice the attack coming from a mile away and you are able to quickly and easily dodge from the harm. The third zombie approaches and is able to get into engagement with Methuselah. And with a powerful half claw, half smack, this very surprisingly strong zombie is able to cause six bludgeoning damage on Methuselah. And the last zombie simply approaches before the next round. Three of you, Mortis, Seeker, and Erky, hears from inside of the room Thorn's voice, alerting you guys of the danger inside. Well, hey there, friends. You've reached the end of this episode of The Sunless Dead Zone. Thank you so much for listening. Subscribe to us on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts, and be sure to catch the next installment of The Sunless Citadel every Thursday at 12 p.m. EST. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review. It's a small way to show your support that goes a long way. To connect with us, follow our social media accounts, and if you'd like to support us, well, you can head on over to our Patreon to join the conversation, leave sneak peeks of our next project, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Our intro score was created by Patrick Horton from Off the Beaten Path Musical. The Sunless Citadel can be found in Tales from the Yawning Portal by Wizards of the Coast. The World of Nosso Mundus was created by Pedro Stockler. Thanks again for listening from all of us at the Storyteller's Tavern. Thank you.